Hello, and thank you for joining us for our digital liturgy this week at Antioch. My name is Sean Del Vaccaro, and I know that I am a new face to just about everyone watching. Even the people that I met a few weeks ago at the amphitheater, I was wearing a mask. So before we dive into the text for today, I would love to take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about me and my family. I grew up just outside Chicago as the youngest of three boys with an amazing mom and dad. And in Chicago, we love to do a few things. First, we love to complain about the weather, which is because it's winter for like eight months and not the fun kind of winter like we have here in Bend. Winter in Chicago is brutal. We also love to eat. If you've ever been to Chicago, you know that there are a million delicious restaurants and cuisines from the obvious stuff like deep dish pizza, Chicago hot dogs, but tons of ethnic food that is indicative of the diversity of the city. And the third thing that is true about Chicagoans is that we love our sports teams. There's plenty of passion to go around. I am not ashamed to admit that one of the best and most emotional days of my life was when the Cubs finally won the World Series. And since I've been here in Bend in Oregon for a few weeks now, I've been learning about the sports scene here. I know that there is a big rivalry between the Ducks and the Beavers, and my allegiance is open, so I'm willing to accept any and all bribes. But I do know that there is a consensus that the Blazers are a team that everybody loves. And as a Chicago Bulls fan, I do need to say thank you to the Blazers and all you Blazers fans. We consider ourselves very grateful that in 1984, the Blazers passed on Michael Jordan, a.k.a. the greatest player of all time. So from the bottom of every Chicagoan's heart, thank you. We couldn't have six titles without your help. So after leaving Chicago, I decided to live and study abroad for a few years. I don't know if you've heard of this other country, but it's called Texas. I went to Baylor University in Waco, which means all you Fixer Upper and Chip and Joanna fans are now paying attention. While Chip and Joe are great, the most important thing that happened to me in Waco was that I met the love of my life, Julia. There's a picture here for you guys from our wedding, and Julia is a delight to partner in life with. She's smart, strong, full of compassion. She's fun and an amazing nurse practitioner. After getting married, we lived in downtown Chicago for almost six years, Julia working as a nurse and me as a pastor, and then we sensed that God was calling us into a new adventure. So we did something crazy. We stepped back from our jobs, packed up our stuff, and decided to live out of our little trailer for several months. There's a picture here. We visited tons of national parks, state parks, and beautiful places all across the western United States. On the trip, we ended up coming to Bend, and then this is when we knew this is where we were supposed to go next. While we fell in love with this place and what made Bend different from the other beautiful places was that when we stopped here, we sensed that God's peace was in this place. We could tell that the Spirit was drawing us to this place and being a part of this community. And so we are so glad to be here. As we continue to dive into the Antioch family and Bend community, we so look forward to getting to know all of you. So my job today is to continue on in our First Allegiance series. As many of you know, during the eight weeks leading up to the election, and then for two weeks after the election, we've been in this series embracing the idea that Jesus is the king of our whole lives, including our civic and political engagement. We see in the life and teachings of Jesus that we are to orient ourselves around two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. These commitments for faithfulness to Christ in a divided world that we have looked at so far are worship, love of neighbor, image of God, biblical wisdom, fruitful speech, biblical justice, and humble learning. As we hope that these commitments have shaped your engagement with politics and with others so far, we want to continue on in our series today with our eight commitment, looking at the commitment to remove the log. Our commitment says this, I commit to giving more attention to critiquing the potential flaws in my own political leanings, conduct, and sin than I give to scrutinizing others. Before we dive into the text, for some context on this passage, we are in Matthew 7, which is the last of three chapters that comprise the Sermon on the Mount. I know that for those of you who've been around Antioch for a few years, that Pete and a few others did an entire series on the Sermon on the Mount, but I can offer you a bit of a refresher. The Sermon on the Mount is arguably the greatest sermon of all time and is at the center and heart of Jesus' teaching during his three-year ministry run. Basically, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' state of the universe address. It's a little politics pun for you. But in the Sermon on the Mount is where we get some of the teachings and sayings of Jesus we know best, like the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, you are the salt of the earth, uh, we get the Lord's prayer, turning the other cheek, loving your enemies, and more. 
While we tend to know a number of the different ideas espoused by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, there's also a disconnect between the Sermon on the Mount and the lives of Christians, myself included. Sky Jathani is an author, speaker, and a pastor who's shaped my thinking. He discusses this tension and through the title of his book asks a very simple but convicting question. What if Jesus was serious? Seriously, what if Jesus was serious? What if he meant what he said about all those things? Because as Christians, and again, myself included, we don't tend to do a great job of following what Jesus actually said. While we may know about many of the ideas that are in the Sermon on the Mount, we don't live our lives as if we are supposed to do these things. We come up with any number of ideas about what the Sermon on the Mount really is. Oh, oh well, the Sermon on the Mount just shows us how much we need God's grace, shows us we can't live up to Jesus. It's an impossible standard. Or maybe now during this political cycle, if we really follow Jesus' example of turning the other cheek and loving our enemies, well, then people would just walk all over us. That's no way to get ahead. And we live in this tension between worshiping Jesus when it's convenient versus actually following what he says. And that's what we've been talking about this entire series, giving you tools and ideas to bridge the gap in every area of your life. So the first section, the Sermon on the Mount, it looks at mercy. The second section, it looks at faith. And the third and final section we're looking at today looks at justice. And today we'll ask the question, what if Jesus was serious about not judging others? How might that change our relationships, our political discourse, and our witness to the world? Today's text comes from Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. It says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This idea of not judging others is one of the more well-known phrases from the Sermon on the Mount. And it's often been misused by Christians and those outside the church as an excuse for any sort of behavior because Jesus says we are not to judge, right? But what does he mean by judge? Since this word can be used a number of different ways, one of the first things we have to do with this passage is get a better understanding of the word Jesus uses for judge. In ancient Greek, just like in English today, this word could really be used in two main ways. The first way to think of judging is discerning between things. For example, I have discerned that this piece of fruit is an apple and not an orange. This is one way of using the word judging, and Jesus actually tells us to do this type of judging. It wouldn't make sense for me to say that this is an apple and someone else to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus tells us not to judge, right? In fact, in just a few short verses, he'll advocate for the importance of judging or discerning between right and wrong and good and evil. So if the first meaning of judge is to discern, then the second meaning is to condemn. And this is when we place ourselves in an area of superiority and condemn others. This is the type of judging that Jesus tells us to avoid. He doesn't want us to condemn others or pass final judgment on them or declare another person as guilty. So we see that Jesus isn't asking us to surrender the judgment of discernment, but the judgment of condemnation. What Jesus is doing here in Matthew 7 is mimicking what he says in Matthew 5 when he says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. He's just flipping it around on its head and saying, don't judge others because you yourself will be judged. When we decide who is condemned and who isn't, we put ourselves in the role of God. We lose sight that we are God's creatures and not God himself. Jesus says, If you want to play that game, it's actually not going to turn out very well for you. If you want to play God and condemn others, you will be judged according to the same measure. Instead, he's making a strong argument for sympathy. He asks us to choose forgiveness, grace, and mercy rather than judgment and condemnation. As Christians, we can tend to think we have the responsibility to give out judgment in the measures we feel that people deserve 
thinking that, you know, this is our job. When we condemn and judge others, they see the error of their ways, right? I will admit that one of the bad habits I picked up while living in downtown Chicago was honking at other cars while driving. If they did something that I deemed worthy of condemnation, it was important that they hear a loud, obnoxious honk from me. Surely, slamming on my horn will cause them to see the error of their ways and promote wise choices in the future. Julia has often given me some feedback that my honking may not be perceived this way, and my perspective is unhelpful to say the least. Jesus says when we decide to judge others so that they will correct their poor choices, we have to beware of our calculus there. That math won't work out in our favor. Instead, we choose forgiveness instead of judgment, instead of condemnation. This idea from Jesus is even picked up by Paul in Romans 2 when he says, therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. When we decide to sit in judgment and condemn others, we lose sight of our primary responsibility and attitude towards towards others, which is love. Whether we realize it or not, our attitude of condemnation can give off a message of superiority and exclusion, that the people we are judging are beyond the reach of God's love. Greg Boyd is an author and a pastor. He puts it this way. He says, You can't love and judge at the same time. It's impossible to ascribe unsurpassable worth to others when you're using others to ascribe worth to yourself. So how do we know if we are doing this? How can we tell if we are crossing over from discernment into condemnation, particularly in this election season? We have to ask ourselves, are our disagreements with others causing us to make judgments on their character? Do we value others less because they have different opinions than we do? Are we willing to condemn someone for who they voted for? If so, we have forsaken our primary responsibility to love others at the cost of trying to be right and superior. As we move on in our text, we see Jesus use a vivid illustration to challenge the listeners even more deeply. He says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. One thing that I think is important to note here is that Jesus is funny. He is intentionally making a joke and using a ridiculous example. He was deliberately being comedic and wanted those listening to think about how ludicrous it would be for someone to be walking around with a log coming out of their eye. I mean, imagine if I had a six foot two by four sticking out of my eye and wanted to pick out a piece of sawdust from your eye. That would be funny. You would laugh. Jesus wants you to laugh at this illustration. Let's not take him too seriously. But he also wants to use this illustration to make a point about our human nature. We tend to consistently undervalue the size of our own faults and overvalue the size of others. I don't know about you, but I can tend to judge myself based on my intentions that I know are good, right? But I tend to judge others based on their actions or only on what I see alone. If we want to go back to our car example, if you cut somebody off, often you tell yourself it wasn't intentional. Or you lost track of the eggs that you just needed to get over. You didn't mean to do that. But if someone else cuts you off, they knew exactly what they were doing, right? They knew it. That is a judgment on their character. What we see is that Jesus wants us to practice self-awareness and not self-righteousness. And I'll say that again. Jesus wants us to practice self-awareness and not self-righteousness. We can become so convinced of our own righteousness that we don't see our own duplicity. We don't see our own compromises, our own sins, our own lack of love, our own selfishness. Jesus tells us if we choose to live and act this way, we are hypocrites. This word that Jesus uses for hypocrite literally meant a play actor or someone who wears a mask. And this type of wearing a mask is not to be celebrated like wearing a mask now, but it meant that you were playing a part. It meant that you were being deceptive. 
and we are to avoid this at all costs. And I'll be honest, that for a long time, I thought this passage meant that we should just kind of mind our own business, not think about specks in other people's eyes because, you know, I'm not supposed to judge. But if you look closely at the passage, Jesus actually provides a way for us to help the person with the speck in their eye. But if we're going to help someone with a speck in their eye, we must deal with our own eye trouble first. Not only is this important so we don't, you know, whack someone with this huge log in our eye, but it demonstrates a sense of humility. That I am self-aware enough and I've reflected upon my own sins or shortcomings. I check in with myself that I'm not pointing out the speck to put you down, but to help build you up. This idea is articulated, well, again by Paul in Philippians when he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Secondly, only when we take the plank out of our own eye can we see clearly enough to help out our brother or sister. In verse 3, when it talks about noticing the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, it uses the Greek word blepin, which means simply seeing. It's it's a mere noticing. However, in verse 5, the Greek word switches to diablepin, which means to see clearly. And so what has changed between verses 3 and 5? The individual Jesus is talking about has taken the log out of their eye. Only when this individual has done the work of self-reflection and self-awareness can they see clearly enough to help out their brother or sister. Only when they have understood their own shortcomings can they be of any service. Henry Nouwen puts it like this. He says, only wounded healers have a right to heal. Self-critical eyes are welcome to aid, but those who are not, are not. For one more perspective, the early church father, John Chrysostom, he puts it like this. He says, we may correct others, but not as a foe, nor as an adversary extracting a penalty, but as a physician providing medicines. If we're to use Pete's chart last week, know-it-alls are not invited to help with specs. They're conceited, they're condescending, and they are pompous. Only those who are humble, discerning, and self-aware servants are encouraged to help with specs. Calling out the speck in someone else's eye makes the focus about how you are different from each other, as if you are speckless. But committing to removing the log in your own eye demonstrates that we're in this together, that we can see how we're more the same than we are different. When it comes to this election season, our hope for you is that you would judge and discern between candidates, that you would take the commitments we've all been making and to discern where God is leading you when it comes to not only how you vote, but also how you interact with others. So we've talked about before that you would engage in this political moment and seek to live out the fruit of the Spirit as you do. However, if you arrive at a place where you're wholesale condemning those who have voted differently than you, then you may have missed the mark. There may be a log in your eye and it doesn't let you see your brother or sister clearly or with love. And that's why the commitment to critiquing the potential flaws in your own political leanings, conduct, and sin is important before you even consider scrutinizing others. Ultimately, what Jesus is talking about here as it relates to justice and judgment is relationships. And if you've noticed, Jesus uses a particular word to talk about this individual with a speck in their eye, brother, which is inclusive of sister. He doesn't use the word stranger, He doesn't use the word enemy. He doesn't use the word that friend from high school posts obnoxious things on Facebook, right? He uses the word brother, brother or sister, because anytime we are helping someone with a speck, we should be in relationship. Jesus' standard for relationships is high and healthy. We're not to play the judge condemning and harsh. We're not to play the hypocrite blaming others while excusing ourselves. Instead, we are to be the brother or sister, caring for others so much that we first blame and correct ourselves and only then seek to be constructive in the help we give others. In just a few short chapters, Jesus will instruct his followers to be wise as serpents and gentle as a dove. It's both and, not either or. We must choose the wisdom of seeing the speck, 
the humility of acknowledging the log so that we can be gentle and walk alongside our brother or sister. My encouragement to you is that in the midst of a polarizing election season, which by the way is not going to magically go away on November 4th or January 21st, is that this is a tangible way in which we can join in with God in the reconciliation of all things. That as we take Jesus' words seriously, we become disciples who acknowledge our own shortcomings, who embrace humility, who take on the posture of servants. We get to partner with God to make all things new, ourselves, our relationships with others, our country and our world, as we recognize that we are citizens of heaven, bringing the kingdom of God in each of these areas. When we remove the log, we demonstrate humility and love to a world that's desperate for both. So Antioch family, may we be a people who join in with God in the reconciliation of all things and declare Jesus as our first allegiance by removing the log from our own eyes as we seek to humbly serve and love our brothers and sisters.